It's a great pleasure to be here <coughs> this afternoon. I've heard a lot of uh, a lot of good knowledge from the, the speakers that were before me. That just ties all my history into what is going on and what is finally starting to happen to our beautiful inlet. Is it on? He doesn't usually run for me. <laughs> <laughs> I always knew I should have been a stand-up comedian. <laughs> now where was I? Huh. I guess I better not be a stand-up comedian. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, with all growing up on this beautiful inlet, I have a hard time trying to start from a certain place. So I actually have to start at the beginning. But seeing as, I, seeing as that I only got 15 minutes and it's clouding over and they pulled the, sh the shades down, I can't see the angle of the sun on that post. So I'm gonna have to guess what 15 minutes is. <laughs> Not I've taken up five minutes. <laughs> Missed my call. A good part of the, my, my, my history, and a sad part actually, is that uh, I went to residential school for one year. I was only seven, I started late, I started at seven. <clears throat> my mother was uh, fairly sickly in the early 40s, just after I was born. So I stayed with my grandmother for quite a few year, of my earlier years. And when I went to residential school, she knew something happened to me. And the following year, she told my father, she said, you take them two boys out of there. And he said, no, no. I went there for eight years, they're going there for eight years. And my grandmother insisted, she says, you take them boys out of there. Because she knew something had happened to me. I changed. And something terrible did happen to me. The good thing at us, my father did take me out of there. And the good thing about it was because I grew up with my, my aunts, my uncles, and my grandmothers. So what I learned in my childhood years while well, my cousin siblings were in residential school, they were teaching me certain things about the inlet, about the forest around the inlet, about Indian River, and about the water, the currents in the water. <clears throat> my father was a championship uh, canoe paddler too, from 36 to 54. And then my brother took over from 64 to 61. That's when my father passed away and we had a train on our own. He never really taught us how to train or how to watch the ocean currents. We had to follow him. If we didn't understand something about the current, we'd, then we'd ask him, and then he'd tell us. He says, okay, if the waves are coming this way and you see a little peaking coming on, on the one side of it, he said, that's where your current is. So you go on the other side of the wave, you're in the back end. So that way your canoe, you're not paddling against the current. 
So when I started following Moran in the single paddle canoe racing, that's what I learned. I learned how to follow him. And that was his teaching. And my uncles explained other things to me about the current. When I was growing up, there was a huge kelp bed just to the east of our reserve. I forgot I had this, John. Sorry about that. <laughs> east of our reserve, right along there, there was a huge kelp bed there. And what my aunties told me, she'd, she'd take us out fishing when we were little in the dugout. And she said, instead of paddling against the wind or the current, you go in the inside of the kelp beds. It's calm water all the way through there. Okay, there was, there was a huge kelp bed right along there, right to where this dock is here. And there's another huge kelp bed along where the, where the tankers are now. And there was another huge kelp bed there. And them kelp beds meant a lot to us. It meant we got tommy cods, we got perch, we got sea bass, a number of other types of fish that we could catch. <clears throat> I didn't really notice when the kelp beds started disappearing. They started disappearing in the late 60s, into the 70s, into the 80s. But I didn't really realize it because they are disappearing slowly and slowly. Of course, then they put the, the, they put the, uh, the log booms on what used to be the Maplewood mud flats. Now it's Maplewood uh, cobbles and shell. <clears throat> and along there, there's a, there's a light here and there's a lighthouse here. We call it a beacon. When I was younger, right up until the 70s, I would say, uh, from here to the wall, on the lowest tide, you had to swim to that beacon. Okay, lately, on a zero tide, you can just walk right out there and climb on it. Okay, people ask me, where's all the sediment coming from? It's coming from all the, all the tide right around here, taking off that point, taking off that point, taking off that point. There's a big ridge right across here. So the tide comes around this way. Little Kate's Park takes off and we out in Kate's Park. The points are all gone. All that sediment ends up right here. In 2007, uh, our fisheries crew, Ed Thomas and I, and Dave Thomas, <coughs> we went and GPSed the mud flats, or the Maplewood flats. And I couldn't believe some of the, the, uh, the cobblestone shell bars that were at least 12 feet high. We GPSed them. And at, that, and at that farthest beacon, the farthest beacon out here, it was only about, uh, maybe from here to the camera, that, that was actually deep where you had to start wading to it. <clears throat> so that means that much is filled in. There's another, be there's another dolphin halfway into the, into the canoe shed that used to be only about five or six feet from the edge. And it was a good drop off. You could literally walk there and just go boom, and you're under. That was 45 feet high and dry. 45 feet. That's filled in since I was a little kid. <clears throat> and then where our starting post is for our, for our new races, from there to the beacon, uh, I guess I got to throw this in. I hold the record. <laughs> 13 minutes and 22 seconds to get from there to there. I think it's a mile and, 
what was it, John? Mile and a third or something, one way. Anyways, <clears throat> that starting pole, I used to have to wear hip waders on a low tide to put the starting pole in. When we GPS that, it was 35 feet high and dry from the low tide. So, so all, all this in here is all filled in. It's from this point, that point, this point, that point, there, 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 and there. That all goes around there. So the tide comes in like this, circles around at this high ridge here, comes all the way back and into here. In here, I live about there. In here, when I was young, when we built our house in 1959. And uh, I'm here. The highest tide in that winter was 13 feet. <clears throat> I think it was 2015, we got a 16.7 tide there. On my eastern side of my property, I live right on water, I've lost at least 25 feet of, of beach. And on the western side, I've lost at least 30 to 35 feet. On the western side, there was uh, a huge blue clay bank that uh, our ancestors used, used to use for uh, pottery, poultices, and all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> all that is gone now. The front of my property has dropped at least, at least six feet, the front part. They were talking about uh, the huge trees that they were describing, the cedar trees. Well, I have a stump that would be, I guess, about three of these paddles in front of the house. <clears throat> I figured on the high tides this January, this last January, the tide was behind, so all the roots are exposed. I figured by probably 2020, that stump will be floating on a high tide. I figured that. <clears throat> the other thing about the, the current, current in there, when I first started paddling uh, on, a high, on a high flood, you'd get about two, two lines of where you could see where the, where the water was coming. It would, it would come, they'd come in here, circle around, back here, circle around again. So you'd get two distinct, distinctive lines where it would keep going around and coming around this way. Uh, when I was thinking about what I'm going to talk about today, I looked out on, uh, out on the water and there's about six lines there where, where you can see, where you can see where the tide keeps going back and forth. <clears throat> Which brings me back to the health of our inlet. Like I mentioned, I didn't notice when the kelp beds were going. Uh, earlier in the 2000s, I started looking around for these kelp. And all we were doing was getting little heads like this. Whereas when I was a little kid, the heads were about that big. The sheets were about as wide as this, this stage here, and probably another third longer than that. <clears throat> this little kelp bed, this little kelp head had a sheet about this long and it was about that wide. That's how bad it was. The other thing I didn't no notice, the other thing I noticed was our seaweed had gone. When I was a child, low tide, the, sea, the seaweed was so thick it'd be up to the second table there. To get our dugout out, we used to have to use a pole to get across. They planted some seaweed uh, two years ago, and that's when I really took a look at it. And it was so sparse, I couldn't believe it. The other thing is the little neck clams have gone too. 
But the good part, you were talking about that, you, I think it was Peter, I was talking about the health, <clears throat> health of the inlet coming along. It is coming back. Because on this last high tide, the tides are so high that we've had three trees go down beside our house, just undermined by the high tides and these big tugs with their with their high wakes, and they fell over. And it's actually one tree was hooked to a, a cedar a cedar stump that was bigger than this. Took the whole stump and everything. So the stump is sitting up like this on this tree that's laying in the water. Anyways, these kelp got hook, hung up onto this tree. <clears throat> and I'm telling you, the heads were about that big, which was a good sign, because the sheets were nice and wide and they had a good length to them. So the health is coming back. The other way I can tell the health is coming back is my duck story. <laughs> <clears throat> I never noticed, I never noticed when the ducks started disappearing. But when I was younger, when I first got married and moved into our house, my uncle used to shoot ducks down the eastern end of our reserve. They'd fly around to the western side where I was, eastern side, and I'd shoot there. They'd take off again and they'd land in front of my uncle on the western <laughs> side. He'd shoot again and they'd come back and I'd get a second shot. Sometimes we'd get three times each. But anyways, I'd get in my dugout, go pick up our ducks, and then we'd have a, a huge duck feed. But they stopped us, stopped us hunting in front of the reserve. So I, that's when I left the ducks alone. Didn't realize that they weren't coming back. And then in the early 2000s, I seen, oh, maybe about 15 duck in front of our place. And I, I wow, they're coming back. But they'd only stayed maybe a week and they were gone because they had nothing to feed on in there. There was no more kelp, no more sea, seaweed. So all the little minnows and anchovies and heron and everything, they were disappearing. So around 2013, I just happened to be looking out, uh, looking out in front of the water like I usually do, and I seen this black line. So I went and got the binoculars, went outside, adjusted my eyes to the darkness, and I looked. And the lights from across the inlet, I could see ducks floating around in the middle there. And I thought, wow. So I kept an eye on it. I think it was 2014, I'd say there would have been maybe 1,000, 1,500. And then in uh, 2015, 2016, I'd say there was about 3,000. So the ducks are coming back. So there's got to be something else coming in, some type of anchovy, herring, minnows, whatever. And my brother, my younger brother, he was uh, he was a fisherman all his life, and uh, I think it was 2015. He told me that he figured that he'd seen a herring spawn, you know, which is another, which is another good, another good sign. But back to the ducks. <clears throat> I got all excited about these ducks. They're back. I take this picture and I take it up to TLR and I showed them. I said, look at all these, look at, look at the picture. And they looked at it and they looked at me and said, they're ducks. <laughs> <clears throat> and I give them my Jack Benny look. <laughs> and I said, I know they're ducks, but they're back. Oh, where did they go? <laughs> so then I had to go back to that story about how much ducks used to be there, and when they disappeared, and then these ducks got back. As it was mentioned earlier that I'm elder in house at Kaplan University. 
I go there twice a week to sit with the students in the Aboriginal room. And one of the one of the young ladies heard about my duck story, and they actually did a did a five six minute documentary on my ducks. <laughs> <clears throat> but we sort of, like I said, when when I when I start telling a story, I'll I'll jump around in all different places, and I'll try and go back to what I was originally what you were talking about, and that's, and that's the currents inside. The, there's a, oops, no, it's okay, no, it's okay. There's a, there's the beacon, then there's another navigational light halfway to Iron Workers, uh, Iron Workers Bridge. I believe it was in 2012, they moved that one big, uh, light, they moved it out, I'd say about 150 yards out because it was too high and dry and it wasn't marking where it was, so they moved it out. So that adds on to how much has filled in there. <clears throat> and there's another light at Way out in Cage Park. If you've ever been down there, you take a look at how far that navigational light is, uh, the beacon. And then there's there's a rock that's between the bank and the light. You take a look at that rock. That rock and that beacon used to be on the bank. Now, that rock is about from here to, I'd say the third table over from the bank. I'd say it'd be out that far. So that explains too how much how much uh, has filled in along the mud flats. And ever since we signed on with the treaty process, that's the first thing I requested was that we re rehabilitate that mud flat because I remember when there was there was seagrass, uh, sea lettuce. Uh, tall uh, bull, bull rushes. I remember when that was all filled there. Because I was a, uh, oops. I was a little hunter. My father bought me a BB gun and I used to shoot little birds. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking about shooting little birds, <laughs> I shot a little owl. My dad told me, he says, you know, you better bury that by a cedar tree. So I buried it by a cedar tree. And he says, next thing you're going to do is you're going to get sick. I got sick. I got sick for a whole week. You know, I've never shot a little bird or another all since. <laughs> Except a duck. <clears throat> I haven't got a sign yet. And I'm looking at the sun, and uh, maybe I got two more minutes. <laughs> the other, uh, the other thing we were talking about was pollution. In the early early 50s, they started a, a housing development on the western side of a reserve. It's on Plymouth and Ellis Street. Ellis Street. And the district didn't have a sewer line out that far yet. So what they did for that development, they pumped it straight out to the mudflats, about halfway out to, out to the end of the mudflats. That was pumping just, it was just, everything was going out there. And we complained to them, too bad this, I'm glad this story is after them. <clears throat> because there was times that we couldn't even go out there to do our crabbing because you really had to step gingerly. We ended up, we had to keep along the, along the sandbar. We couldn't go amongst the green lettuce no more because under the green lettuce you'd see a hump and you knew that it was a crab. All you did was take a stick and flip it up and 
you'd see whether it was male or female. You left the female there, you took the male. Which brings me back to another story. When I said that my father showed me, he didn't tell me, he showed me first. Then he told me. Okay, my aunts and uncles showed me how to flip these crabs over. But they didn't tell me you used your foot. Because in them days we didn't wear, you know, water shoes or anything. We just went out there with bare feet. And of course, I flipped the crab over to see how big it was. I'm bare feet. You can imagine what happened. <laughs> I had a big toe that was a big toe. <laughs> Sun's starting to get over there. <laughs> but when I, when we finished training, like every athlete that knows that you just can't stop training right there and then. You gotta, you gotta work yourself down. So after canoe season was over, on a, on a weekend, on a Sunday, I'd get back in my single paddle, and I'd paddle from there all the way out to the railroad bridge, paddle all the way around here, all the way there. Sometimes I go in, into Port Moody, paddle around here, right through here, all the way up here, and all the way up there. And then back through here, and home. It would take me anywhere from, I don't know, six hours. I'd be gone for six hours. But my stockless, my wife, she didn't worry about, about me because I was in my canoe. But I used to enjoy that. And that's when the kelp beds and everything was still there. So I knew where the tides were all the time. Now that the tides have come up and the, 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 the mud flats has spread out, everything's narrowing down. Tides are higher. In front of my house, I never ever seen a whirlpool on a high flood. I was out on my balcony one day and it was high flood, and all of a sudden I seen these whirlpools going by in front of my house. I couldn't believe it. It was hard to believe that there's that much water moving through there. But back to the kelp beds, that's what slowed the water down. That's what helped these little fish. That's what helped the salmon coming down. The last story about the salmon up at Indian River. There used to be a big mud flat there too before, the, before they started doing the shingle boats. <clears throat> and there's a lot of bull rush here. And we used to catch the little guys that were coming out, or the nursery fish, we used to catch them. But we used to go up on a gas boat, a little gas boat, and it had a fish guard on the back, on a propeller. This one time, the fish were so thick in that river, we couldn't get the gas boat in. Usually we'd get the gas boat into as far as the cabins were, and then when the tide went out, there was a big enough hole there for the gas boat to sit in there. But we couldn't get the gas boat in. We had to anchor the gas boat outside and go in by dugout. And as we were going in by dugout, my dad couldn't paddle no more. He had to use a pole because we were clubbing the fish. And as that story was told about the young kids, we weren't allowed to club the fish. We had to catch them. My father told my cousin that was up the bow of the dugout, he says, just reach in and grab us a fish for supper. So he just reached in, and that was our fish. The fish was that thick. In that river, I never ever seen a seal. One trip we went up to, and this was around 20, Oh, five, I think, when we brought the elk back up there. I think it's mile five or something like that, mile six, where the bridges are. I seen a seal up there. I've never, ever seen a seal that far. 
And when the fish do come, there is at least, I'd say, a hundred seal up there. Just, they know which one's a female. They dive, come up, and just rip the stomach out, and that's it. The crabs are happy, but the fish aren't happy. <clears throat> The last time we seen killer whale, blackfish, in, in our, on our side of the bridge of Second Eros was probably 1992, but they just made it up to the, the oil refinery because there was too many boats falling up there. And my, my brother, like I said, he's a fisherman, he owned a boat, he went out there and told them people, you know, just leave them alone, but they just kept falling up. That was the last time. Now, so it's happy to see that they at least got back to First Narrows Bridge mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. I think I've gone <laughs> two minutes over. <laughs>